sometimes you need to come up, you know, with a compromise and 80% solution is still better than no solution. I think that we all need to realize that working in any field, including privacy, is a creative work. What is our customer satisfaction? Do they trust us? And that is where I see now where privacy can be used to build trust. Hello, everyone. I am Sergio Maldonado, and this is Masters of Privacy, a set of interviews covering the intersection of marketing, data, privacy, and technology with a clear goal in mind, which is redefining the relationship between people, brands, and media around transparency and control which is to say we're aiming for real customer centricity or, if you will, human centricity. We regularly talk to DPOs, CMOs, CDOs and whoever else we find interesting and able to share valuable insights. So we hope you like it. Please do reach out if you have any ideas on future topics or speakers. Okay, we have Stefan Filipovic. He's a privacy lawyer that began his career at the outset of GDPR enforcement in 2018. Throughout the years, he's built his expertise by working at a law firm focusing on IP and privacy at a university as a researcher investigating legal challenges in regulating AI-based technology and finally as a privacy officer and a counsel for a few Norwegian companies. Today, he's a DPO at Remarkable which is the Norway-based digital notebook that I use and love, which is how I first bumped into Stefan. For several years, he's also volunteered at ICANN and for a period of time at NIST's privacy workforce. Beyond his focus on privacy compliance, he maintains a strong passion for information security, computer science and risk management, as well as corporate governance and finance. Let's get started. Stefan, thanks for joining me. Thank you, Sergio. Pleasure to be here. So let's see what you as a young DPO have to share. You know, I'm sure much more than you think. And uh, But to get started uh, somewhere, um, you started in 2018. So if we started to go over the challenges of, of a young DPO, the challenges that you saw back then, how would you summarize them? Well, <laughs> um, in in one way, it's an interesting position and time to be, because think about this, you come straight from the uni in 2016-17, and you go into this GDPR frenzy that started in 2018. And I remember in 2016-17, I was working for a law firm uh, as an IP lawyer and wondering, why is no one looking at this GDPR thing? Seems like it has teeth. And I was lucky enough that my hourly rate was very low. So any work that was coming in relation to privacy was coming to my desk. And I was like, you know what? This is um, a great opportunity. And I recall vividly, 2008 came and people actually started worrying um, and to a certain extent panicking. And that's where actually I think the whole thing started rolling for us. Because up until then, I can tell during the law studies, privacy was my passion, but it was very clear that I couldn't pursue working in privacy full-time and still pay my mortgage. Funny how things go. Eh? We had seen GDPR coming from afar. And in 2016, it was really <laughs> low. And yet, we always push it to the last minute. And then all of a sudden, oh, it's May 20, 25th, <laughs> yeah. it was... Right. Okay. So then, what do you think about, you know, how do you get informed? How did you learn? How do you get involved into the community? How was your experience over those, throughout those years? Well, to be very honest, I recall it being a bit overwhelming because all of a sudden we are coming into the field and there is so much going on. You know, you get this new law, but then okay, you have these guidances from, from you know, uh, Averting Party Article 29. Then you also have, you know, a lot of different authorities coming with the uh, guidances and they were not kind of uniform. And then you as a young person, like, okay, okay, but okay, I'm getting into it, right, GDPR. But then you realize it's not only GDPR, right? 
to do well in privacy, you need to have a holistic understanding of laws. And then we have right cookies, well, e-privacy, marketing laws, and everything that came later. And I recall vividly also going to conferences, right, and being overwhelmed. People talk about one thing and you don't know what to focus on. Yeah. And, and I need to ask you, how is it in Norway? Because uh, Norway is, is so from a Southern European perspective, right? Norway looks like it's sitting there sort of ingesting all of these laws, but not having that much of a say in it. I must say it's hard for me to speak about history, provided I moved in here in 2018. <laughs> True. Um, but you, you definitely saw a huge change. I think at the beginning, it seemed to me there was a lot of like consultancies um, and a lot of, you know, law firms offering their services, but then companies quickly realized that, hey, this is actually quite expensive and we need to have some internal, you know, competence, someone who's going to work on privacy full time. And uh, that's where I think definitely shift has changed. And that worked in favor of us uh, young practitioners because there was increased number of jobs. And as I mentioned to you, it was so crazy to me when I realized, damn, it is easier for me to find job in privacy, which is my passion, than working as a trademark lawyer. Yes, um, yes. And it, yeah, the trend is still, uh, you know, continuing. Yeah, yeah. And then over time, I see, I mean, Noah is a, is a pretty key actor these days, right? With late, with recent uh, resolutions on the on the meta cases and so on. It's been pretty, pretty active. What do you think about then Once you go into this, I understand that you're facing a double challenge. One is that first you dive in deep into privacy law, but also you're moving from the world of law firm working for all these companies to the in-house space where you need to understand the business. How was that? So for me, that was a very interesting path. Um, I learned a lot and essentially faced what a lot of my peers faced as well, which is you don't really understand the business context, right? You got used to working as a lawyer consultant, giving advice, but never actually owning implementation or working, you know, when the rock hits the fan. So I think kind of one of the challenges that uh, younger people experience is, well, lack of business understanding. You know, like as a young professional, you really want to go and prove yourself and start working like ASAP, but you don't understand business. You know, maybe you're in B2B, you know, not in B2C. And then different things apply, as well as you need to understand that you can have the best privacy and compliance documentation in the world, but if your business is not profitable, not making money, there is not much you're adding to the table. So having this holistic approach of understanding right what are the marketing needs, sales team, needs of security teams, and so on. Yeah. What's the hardest? Is it marketing or HR or from your perspective, what's the hardest? Um, in my view, it was kind of understanding what people in the company do, you know, what are different business units responsible. And instead of me making them kind of learn how to do with me, I was learning how to work with them. So really understand what they care about. Um, and that's where something we, you don't learn in law school, but it's very important is risk management. And to give you an example, you know, I walk to work or cycle to work every day. When I walk, I do jaywalk. I do break the law, but the risk is very low compared to, you know, when I'm cycling, when I'm driving, of course, I will stop, you know, and follow all the rules. And it's same as um, it's in privacy working companies. Sometimes you need to come up, you know, with a compromise and 80% solution is still better than no solution. Very good point. Yes, yes. I mean, you know, we, so here on this podcast and me, I mean, in, in my life, we, we, um, we tend to focus on the overlap with marketing, right? Marketing mm-hmm. technology and so on. Mm-hmm. And no surprise, I found that older DPOs and people that were given the DPO role because they were already handling some area of compliance or they came from security struggle with many of the concepts that we need to deal with. So you mentioned the privacy as a framework. If you do not understand storage and access with the, even these new concepts, or these new meanings, you know, assigned to them, it's very hard to go around it and and you spend your life asking for help. I guess that would be an advantage of a young DPO, wouldn't it? Um, I think so. 
I think to a lot, it helps to understand information security, cybersecurity, and networks. I remember I was a student and realized, oh my God, internet is not magic. Internet literally goes through cables, right? I want to access some, something in the US, that's where it's hosted. Well, actually, this goes under the ocean, you know, that information and comes to my computer. And these are just some very basic things that people understand now. But then that's how you, that's the beginning of your, like, that's how you start building. Because what's going to happen? You will be speaking to, for example, if you work for a hardware or software company, to a lot of product developers, uh, programmers, and you need to be on equal footing with them. You need to be able to maintain conversation and to understand what they're saying. Um, because sooner or later, someone will try to take you on the right. And that's where you need to be a bit cautious and also be able to help because then people respect you. You guys are on the same page and uh, that's how you make a progress. And that's where I think having a lawyer's hat is an issue because you, as Sergio mentioned, marketing. And I think that's where lawyers are seen as um, troublemakers oftentimes because you think, oh, no, now they're going to tell us you, you cannot do this, you know, Party and that. poopers, totally. All the uh, absolutely. But you, you know what? To be very honest, um, I'm not one of those dogmatic privacy lawyers who is against ads. I do like getting a good discount on a, you know, shoes I wanted to buy or on some like flights. So I think that it can be done in a way where you will allow business to flourish, but also preserve, you know, right to data protection and privacy. Very good. Thank you. So let's fast forward now, six years. So what challenges do you see? What I see around my peers um, is that actually a lot of people experience fatigue and lethargy, and that's a uh, real and I don't have a silver bullet. You know, I can tell you what works for me. Um, but I was certainly one moment of my career, to be honest, where I was like, do I want to continue doing this? Um, and I think that's, first of all, normal to ask yourself. But what kind of helped me, I think, stay is that privacy is really one of the best fields to satisfy your curiosity. Because you really, as we discussed, need to understand beyond law. You need to understand technology. But you also need to understand business and what, what drives the business because uh, privacy security is going to stay. And that's where actually, if you're starting about how can I help my business use this as a competitive advantage? Yeah, it's getting overwhelming. On the one hand, everybody wants to enjoy the process learning, the latest new toy. Everyone is jumping on AI governance because it's new, <laughs> you know, and, and, and shiny. And at the same time, data processor audits are getting out of control. There's so much work piling up. All of these product managers, they want your help. They want you to jump in and to give your opinion. So you need to stop the flow to keep your cool. And at the same time, you're enjoying the process of learning. So what's your answer to that? I think that we all need to realize that working in any field, including privacy, is a creative work. Um, and working with people is fun. You know, we are doing this uh, online. But to me, although I like working from home, there is nothing like going to the office and actually bouncing those ideas of each other, you know, being in the same room, you know, room and just doing things. So... I think that's what one mindset which helps is that you as a privacy professional, you're the one who can help your business and your colleagues. They need you. That's why you're there. That's why you have your salary. And there is no one who can do this job but you. I really, I really agree. There's so many ways to show transparency. I mean, I'll wait for you to tell me what you think about that. But, you know, there's, there's so many ways to navigate that. So what else do you think? is a challenge to to sort of complete or round up your summary of the challenges that you see now, today? Well, <laughs> I think obviously, right, the landscape, which is full of new laws, regulation and guidances, but also a lot of noise. You know, as I mentioned, you go to co privacy conference or you go on LinkedIn and you just keep hearing people talking about data transfers. And look, they're very important. 
But I think there are some more fundamental things that some businesses need to fix, right? Uh, for example, like data retention schedules. I'm giving a basic training, teaming up with a security function, right? Like privacy is not just about documentation. It's really about um, actually making the whole system work, which has the security component. So it really helps just to be on the lookout um, and to map. So I think there are a lot of young professionals, including myself, made the mistake of just starting to do work without actually stopping and making a privacy program, right? And getting stakeholder and management buy-in. Because what really matters is not what we do in a week, but what we can do in six months or 12 months, something we can be proud of. And that's where you need management support and some sort of patience. <laughs> Very good. Long-term thinking, properly. You're right. But this is the world that we live in. Everything is short term. <laughs> and if you start looking at LinkedIn, we were talking about mm -hmm. LinkedIn the other day, doing a newsroom mm -hmm. saying how these mm -hmm. also manipulate your dopamine and everything around us is about short term reaction. Now, let's uh, look at the opportunities, now sort of the even brighter side. Um, so uh, what opportunities do you see now, you as a, as a young uh, DPO? Well, I think one great thing for our generation is that actually we came late to the party. So we were actually able to, you know, use all the accumulated knowledge and understanding and just have it there in front of us already served. And I think that's a huge asset along with a fresh pair of eyes. I think what I definitely noticed is that it's very common now to see, oh, how can we maybe, you know, use some tools and softwares, right, kind of to help us document, you know, maybe you as a business with two, three, 500 employees don't need to have a tool which costs 100,000. Maybe you need something smaller, something, you know, that you can, it's modular and you can scale up. So I think that's where um, it's a good thing. But also we're talking about though how now these days we are all kind of being reactive Yes. Um, because there is something which is right. You can agree very nice uh, when you receive a task and you just do it and then you're like, yes, but guess what? I never look back and think, oh, I'm so glad I reviewed these data processing agreements. I did such a good job, right? But, you know, updating a privacy notice or automating some sort of like data subject request is something you look for, you're proud of. Um, so I think it just helps us thinking what I will be proud of in 12 months. I think the idea of being in attack mode instead of defense mode, that's super important. So you start your day and you look at, instead of just opening up your inbox and being flooded by requests, you know, random ideas and thoughts, start I think that's a basic of time management, right? I've done this in for a long time. Before that, you go in the attack mode. Okay, what is it that I want to do? Before I open the floodgates, what am I going to get done today? Yeah, very good. And what about um, how have you been navigating these building blocks? So communication, um, you know, working with the teams. I guess over time, you develop a better working relationship. They trust you more. How has that evolved? Yes, um, thanks for asking that. As mentioned, I don't think there is one solution, you know, for everything, but I think it kind of helps, right? First thing, establish relationships, understand what people do, meaning like empathize, and then come up with some sort of privacy program. Because I think when you work just in a privacy office, and oftentimes just one person or max two, is that you can easily end up, you know, feeling isolated. But you know what? If you have a communication with the management and you have, let's say, by monthly check-in for you to be accountable, that's how you can make progress because sometimes blocker is going to be in marketing, in HR, in other departments, and that's where actually escalation can help. So have a privacy program, have a stakeholder buying and know where to escalate. But I think also, which is common for privacy, is there kind of two components of uh, uh, privacy, right? So you have kind of this um, business compliance aspect of, oh yeah, these GDPR requirements apply to us. But I personally think uh, that equally important is market aspect of compliance, which is, hey, we are here for our customers, for our consumers. Let's see what applies to them, what they care about so that their use of our products and services makes them compliant with laws. And that's kind of sometimes hard, you know, to communicate. But once the management understands that, they're like, well, yeah, of course, because that makes our product appealing. And I think Apple did the best job, right? They're like a US company, uh, but they started thinking and working on privacy 
even before I knew what maybe what privacy was. So just to that, it just occurred to me, I remember 2016, I think, um, Apple started selling iPhones for 1,000 euros in Europe. And people say, oh, this is crazy. You know, it doesn't make much sense. No one's going to buy it. Well, you know what? That's when also they doubled down on privacy and security. So what happened in that financial year is their revenues went up 25% around and their profit went 15. So definitely you can, you know, use privacy as an advantage to your business. They sell it so well, no matter what they do, they they do sell it very well. I've had my my <laughs> issues with their own notion of privacy, but that's for another day. <laughs> uh, but the thing is, you're right. People do appreciate that kind of respect. I do see it goes down to respect. So transparency is a key one. Whatever you do with, you know, after you collect data, you mentioned retention periods. There's so many things that sort of simply tell your customers how much you respect them. It, it sometimes is as basic as that, right? So what do you, what else would you add to that as an, as an opportunity these days as something or something that you strive to improve and sort of keeps you motivated because you know you haven't really mastered it yet? Well, aside of compliance work and stuff, I'm personally always really passionate about, you know, building products that people love. And how do you do that is through actually getting some feedback and some metrics. So old way of thinking is that, hey, let's focus on legal risks we identified and avoided. I actually think that it makes sense also to think about um, what is our customer satisfaction? Do they trust us? And that is where I see now where privacy can be used to build trust, which is an amazing opportunity. Um, And you mentioned transparency, right? Think about how GDPR involved. In 2018, yes, privacy policy or privacy notice, that's what all we need to satisfy this requirement. But you would agree that now, it's not only about that. It's about having FAQs, maybe in your sales or communication, using privacy and security and really showing to people, oh, this is how we do, and then you can find more. And people do read and do reach out. Only yesterday, I was sharing the same idea with a customer saying, look, yes, it's all good on the privacy notices, but the FAQ needs to reflect the same principles. In the end, many people are only going to read that Absolutely. And that's where what it seems like theme of this conversation is that people should not be dogmatic, right? We should be able to change opinion in the light of new circumstances and to constantly adapt. So I think that's where we could maybe greet both opportunity and the challenge. We tend to be very opinionated sometimes. I mean, in this, I, I don't know if it's the same of every community, but it, in the privacy compliance community, this very strong sort of pockets of deeply ingrained beliefs that find it very hard to to move, to change stack. Do you think that's a problem? Well, I, I think it become a problem if you don't use your critical thinking. Um, because I'll be very honest, I'm wrong all the time, you know, in life. Like, And I think that's where the key is actually to have a level of introspection to say, hey, this thing I thought is actually wrong, but it's the way to improve. So I think that as, as a young DPO is, Fine to make mistakes, even, you know, it's fine to make mistakes all the time as long as you improve, right? And I think that's the best way to learn it. Maybe I'm influenced by the book I'm just reading. It's essentially about... What book is that? Yeah, so it's essentially about like, uh, it's called Black Box. And it's about how, if you think about airplanes, that's some like metal wreck, which seems kind of unsafe, but they're actually incredibly safe. It's the safest mode of transportation. And the reason is that they have a black box which you know, records everything, which is all controls and communication. So there you can always able to conduct investigation and go to root cause and improve. Just like when you have a data breach, you know, hopefully you're going to go to root cause and improve. Whereas if you think about when you go to doctor or when it comes to medical errors, well, oftentimes it's- Or you're driving a car, yeah. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> so um, I think this level of introspection and just uh, allowing yourself to make mistakes and improve is- a uh, a way to go. One last question. What do you think about our relationship with supervisory authorities and how is your perception? How are people evolving in that relationship? Well, I'm actually grateful that in Europe we have like what 27 supervisory authorities or how many? Um, because I do see them as an ally 
And it goes in both ways, right? So if you have a data breach, yes, report to authorities and they can actually help you because you know what? If it is a very big data breach, they have actually right tools that they can help you mitigate, mitigate it I and mean, address it. Uh, whereas if it's small, well, still not an issue. You show that you're accountable. And if there is a complaint, I see you know, a lot of people being concerned when they get like questions from authorities. I think that's a tremendous opportunity to come to authorities and say, hey, this is how we do all our compliance. And we are proud of it because as you know, data protection world, there is so much gray zones and sometimes you can work with authorities actually. And also there's this, this fallacy of the, you know, people chasing the seal of approval, right? 100% compliant. I keep, that, I keep seeing that everywhere. GDPR <laughs> compliant, you know, a seal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it takes so long for, for everyone to understand that you cannot just simply boast of 100% compliance. Uh, absolutely. You're spot on. I mean, that's a constantly moving target. It's a continuous improvement. As we both improve, as privacy professionals, that's how your privacy program, your privacy compliance in the company improves. So that's where, uh, as we discussed, you know, risk management is really a key. Um, and I can give you an example. You know, I really wanted to lose like 20 pounds. And if my goal is, oh, I'm going to lose 20 pounds in six months without having those marginal gains, I'm never going to lose. Actually, that's an example. But if you set up realistic targets and say, hey, I know every other month, five pounds, you will get to there. And that's where I think that uh, we can agree that only way for something to happen is to make a conscious decision. And that's where it really helps to have this plan laid out and to own it um, and pride yourself for a relentless execution. Any last articles, any other books that you have read that you think are worth mentioning? Anything you would like to share? Yeah. Um, one book I really enjoyed reading was Privacy is Hard and Seven Other Myths by uh, Yap Heng Hopman. The book, among other things, talks about values of privacy as well as about privacy and friendliness of current technologies. Um, it also you know, goes to provide numerous examples and show that there is still a lot of room for improvement. For example, while you know everyone is talking about privacy by design, security by design, it is also very important to acknowledge that nailing good design is extremely hard. But once you have it, the feeling is immensely gratifying and it benefits everyone. So it essentially hints that privacy professionals should try to challenge conventional wisdom and work closely with designers, developers and other colleagues to firstly really identify and understand the problem and then create new and privacy-friendly solutions. We'll add it to the notes. Thank you. Thank you, Sergio. It was really a pleasure. Thanks again. Bye. Okay, that's all for today. Please help us gain some visibility and grow in every sense of the word by hitting five stars on whichever podcast player you use if you think we deserve them. And remember that you will find some episode notes and links to our social channels on mastersofprivacy.com. Thank you for listening.